Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of the Sunday Stream. Yes, we are live today, and I am joined by the ever-so-studious and the recently moved Semiagog. How are you? I am very, very well Prudentialist. Very happy to be here. You know that I have uh, supported your channel since I first became aware of it, and you, so I'm so happy to see it growing and so happy to be able to be here as a guest. I hope everyone uh, who follows me, most of them, of course, will already be well familiar with you, but I hope everyone who follows me who might be here for the first time will uh, subscribe to your channel. So yeah, very, very happy to be here. Thank you. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you're back. You're one of my favorite people to talk to when it comes to the goings on in the world geopolitically. And uh, we're once again, the current events have brought us back together to discuss some things that we've talked about before. But uh, the recent news with regards to Lithuania's sanctions to the Kaliningrad Oblast has uh, brought into the attention of a, an old and important uh, gap, uh, the uh, Sulwaki Gap. Um, which I will put up a map now for those unfamiliar. This is the small stretch of territory between the Kaliningrad Oblast and Belarus. And it's about 60 kilometers. And this stretch of land is right in between Poland and Lithuania. So let me go put up a map for all of us to have a better understanding for our geography. Because one of my favorite lines of all time is from... Uh, the ever so quotable Mark Twain, who had once said, you know, God made war so Americans could learn geography. And so that's what we're going to do today. So our American friends will get a geog <laughs> geography lesson. Doubtless, so. uh, doubtless a much needed one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, with current events, they probably need to. But I, I'm, 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 I would be remiss if I didn't bring up that uh, people who are more aggressive about intervening in the Ukrainian situation from the Americans, not like we already are intervening, but the, the further away they were from where Ukraine is on a map, they were more likely to engage. So um, geographic illiteracy, I just think is a part of being American at this point. Yes. Sad, but uh, quite true. Yes. So, it's for a little bit of background, this, of course, has to deal with the, the Lithuanian-Polish border and the uh, Kaliningrad question, sort of been the question about what to do in regards to the um, secluded Kaliningrad Oblast, uh, really since 2004, after the Baltics were enlarged around 2004 with the European Union, uh, which included, I want to say, 2004's EU enlargement included... Estonia, Hungary, Lithuania, Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia. So most of the former Eastern Bloc countries of the Soviet Union under the Warsaw Pact had um, been included in here. And also, of course, the uh, Visegrad group were all put in there. Um, and the enlargement also came in with Bulgaria and Romania in 2007. So um, we can kind of see this all put in place here in, in the back, just as already you see... Uh, the EU flags between Lithuania and Poland, but of course we would also be remiss to say that these nations are also part of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So you're already in one of the big hot spots right now, um, and it has been a hot spot since really the end of the Cold War. Indeed, and is there a is there a do you have a, a map that shows uh, uh, Europe in general? Just I, to uh, I do to throw in some uh, context. I, so I have topographical. We can also I'll, I'll get to that, but um, let me just get a, a, a larger map of Europe. I'd probably be remiss that I don't have one of those. I have everything else up for today except uh, your right, basic just, political borders map of Europe. I just found it very useful as an American who has to uh, study geography in order to understand foreign wars to uh, to see the bigger uh, picture because that little gap, as you uh, very well know, um, is. Uh, is essentially how much of an opening uh, NATO has uh, in order to uh, reach the Baltics if they wanted to reinforce them. Now, of course, there are aspects that can be handled by air 
and there are aspects that can be handled by C. I expect you'll probably be discussing uh, here momentarily why it is that C and air um, movement of uh, reinforcements from NATO to those Baltic states through that little gap that you can see there just uh, between uh, Kaliningrad and Belarus there, uh, where Poland touches Lithuania, where the green and the orange come together. That's important because Kaliningrad, as you doubtless know, is able to um, to uh, put the thump down on uh, naval and air movement in that area because of how armored it is. I'm, I'm guessing, again, you're going to discuss that. But that gap being, you know, roughly 60-something kilometers or 40-something miles, um, at its narrowest point, um, allows, uh, it, you know, creates a, a sort of bottleneck there. So if you look at Belarus to the south of those uh, states, again, as I'm sure you know, but for our viewers, um, and Russia on the other side, it's really just, uh, you know, Poland that's touching Lithuania there. And since Belarus is um, increasingly back on board with, uh, with Russia, um, that overland route there in terms of reinforcing or uh, coming to the assistance of the Baltics, if something were to break out, is extremely important. And because of the concentration of military units and air defenses and all the rest in Kaliningrad, um, the sea and the air would not be as viable um, without like, you know, going into the serious kind of apocalypse levels of conflict between Russia and, and NATO. So that overland corridor, uh, therefore, becomes much, much more important. Yeah, and uh, I, I had looked it up, and so it, it is a 65 kilometer long gap um, from basically Belarus to the Kaliningrad Oblast. So that's about 40 some odd miles. So it's a very thin stretch of uh, of land. And topographically speaking, the reason why this has been so important historically, not just in this uh, current geopolitical crisis, but also in past foreign wars, is including, of course, the Second World War. Uh, this was your gateway into the Baltics and, of course, access to Russia. Um, those familiar with their World War II history will know during Operation Barbarossa that this was an important um, piece of territory in order to uh, aim. The, the incorporation of the, what was then the Konigsberg area of East Prussia um, was a stated war aim of the Soviet Union during the Tehran Conference in 1943. And by the end of World War II, the city was captured by the Soviet Union. And uh, by the allies, by according to the Potsdam Conference, and this was given to the Soviet Union. So this has been an important piece of territory geographically, um, not just because of its history for the military conflict, but also because um, Russia, you know, had an additional access closer to Western Europe and into the Baltic Sea, which would give them access, of course, to the North and the Atlantic. Um, and even now, post-Soviet Union, um, whether you want to be that close to Finland, but this gets you a little closer and more warm water ports. And uh, as Semyagog rightfully alluded to, we will be talking about why this place is so important militarily, because it's one of the most militarized enclaves uh, geographically on Earth. Yeah, so. and certainly the most militarized in Europe, if I remember correctly. One last thing before you yeah, for uh, drop this map. Um, you're familiar with my little uh, theory about this being the girdle around the tight waist of Europe. In terms mm -hmm. of Russia, which has to deal with these huge fronts, you know, we talked about um, Barbarossa, you know, if you think about um, World War Two, anyone who has studied that history knows that, um, that there were that the front was absolutely staggering in its length because of the vast distances involved as you know, uh, Germany and um, their allies attempted to push into Russia. And so they'd end up with these huge bulging salience. You know, we're seeing what happens to forces when they have to deal with salience. You know, it's kind of like you might have a, a 10 foot space, but if you take a string uh, and cross that 10 foot space by making big loop de loops going in all directions, if you pulled that string out straight, it would end up being like 40 or 50 feet, uh, even though the distance is only like 10. So, um, I bring that up because it would be of some concern, as I've mentioned in previous streams of my own, some of them, I think with you, um, it would be of some concern for Russia to make sure that they have the shortest possible front they can manage if they were attempting to um, stop an invasion coming from uh, Europe eastward towards them. Um, and so if you look at Kaliningrad, that little, you know, sort of a pink blotch up there between Poland and Lithuania, <clears throat> and then you look down to Ukraine on the Black Sea, and you can see Moldova there, which is a place where things are beginning to heat up. Right there on the top part of Moldova is Transnistria. 
And so from right where uh, uh, Prude has his cursor right there, all the way up to Kaliningrad, if you draw a straight line there, that's the narrowest waste of Europe. So um, it, it could conceivably be if Russia wanted to create a defensive front there, that would be the spot to do it where they could concentrate their troops uh, more effectively than if they were sprawled out all over the place. So when we think about the business of this uh, Suvalki Gap um, and the Baltics, that is a central part of the picture. But given that we know what's going on in Ukraine at present, we know about this idea of sort of a narrow waste across uh, Europe here and Russia's interest in keeping these areas because Transnistria, it's kept since 1991 in this new form, uh, Konigsberg or um, or uh, Kaliningrad, they've kept since 1991. So they planned ahead. They knew this was coming. And it's my view that they... Um, have maintained uh, frozen conflicts in Transnistria and uh, uh, maintained their presence in uh, Kaliningrad, um, not only for this aspect of uh, getting to the Baltics or preventing resupply by NATO or reinforcement, but also because they might have that whole front open up. And we should bear in mind that interesting things are going on in Estonia. Um, interesting things are going on in Lithuania. Interesting things are going on in Bulgaria and in uh, Moldova. So it is my it is my impression that with as the things in Ukraine develop, we're going to see more of this this kind of uh, tension and pressure um, showing signs uh, in these various areas that are of considerable importance to Russia where uh, NATO has made inroads, whether that is from uh, the Baltics there and in the region of Kaliningrad or all the way down to uh, the western shores of the Black Sea and some of the new uh, NATO possessions there. I hope, uh, as a matter of fact, just a quick pitch of my own, uh, later this week, I believe I'll be talking with Praise of Folly about some of these countries like uh, Bulgaria and uh, and Moldova and the rest. So this this is actually a great thing. I'm happy to be here with you on it, Prude, because you're going to help me get up to speed with uh, with the story here in the Baltics as well. Yeah, and it's important that uh, I think um, Scrump Monkey just pointed out in the chat that just, you know, old style geopolitics is back. And I think that that's innately true in a lot of regard here. A lot of people after the Soviet Union had fell uh, had said that some of the theories that were brought out by Mackinder, Speakman, and the rather venerable American diplomat George, F. Uh, George Kennan had said that these ideas of the Rimland or the Heartland were, were no more. And I think that like people who thought that that was the end of history, that they were uh, definitely proven wrong on that point. I think that a lot of these thinkers were vindicated. So that tight belt that you're talking about, I want the audience to put a pin in that because we will return to that in just a little bit. But there was an article that was published back in 2019 that I think does a pretty good illustration, and I'm going to put it up on screen now for our audience to read along, about why um, this area is so militarized in the present context and probably why it's even more militarized since the events in February to today. Um, so this comes from the, uh, this was published in 2019. This was from the uh, Beg and Stott Center for Strategic Studies, but, um, oh, 2018, my bad. But we'll get now to the gap itself. Um, so, Without question, the loss of the Baltic ports in 1991 was a serious blow to the Kremlin. After the collapse of the USSR and the loss of the Baltic states, Putin was left with only two northern ports, Kaliningrad, formerly Konigsberg, ice-free all year, and Kronstadt, frozen in water, although modern icebreakers have been helping to alleviate that problem. And if you do want to know more about icebreakers, I'm going to shill one of my earlier streams on this subject where we talked about the future of the Arctic and Russia's advantage um, with its icebreaker fleet. So if you're interested to know more about icebreakers, we can go back to that one. Um, but he says icebreakers have been helping alleviate that problem. Presently, Russia's Baltic fleet is located in the western town of Baltiysk, um, formerly Pilau in Kaliningrad. Um, a former uh, Prussian enclave annexed at the end of World War II, Kaliningrad is a small region separated by Russia proper by Lithuania and Belarusia. Naturally, this makes it makes its management difficult. Most of its replenishment of its supplies are by sea and air. And Semyagog referenced that earlier. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, while far from Russia's mainland, it has its advantage of pretty much being nearer to the major cities of her European adversaries. Recently, in addition to deploying more troops to the borders of the Baltic states and new ships to the Baltic Sea, Russia has been heavily arming its Baltic enclave. 
Visiting Kaliningrad in early of December of 2016, analyst Yelena Morozosa said, Economically backward and cut off from Russia, this 6,000 square mile stretch of land is now the easily most militarized territory anywhere in Europe. Leningrad also contains a large Russian airbase, and in 2012, the Russians began to deploy their S-400 missiles and advanced integrated air defense system. At the present time, they also have uh, Iskander ballistic missiles, said to already be nuclearized with a range of 400 miles. There is also a powerful radar listening station that covers all of Europe, and a new railway that is being built um, happened in the Georgian province of Abkhazia before the 2008 invasion. Um, there are presently over a million people living there, a fourth of which are the military, represented are a naval infantry brigade and two motorized rifle divisions. But since Putin's interventions in Georgia, Ukraine, and Syria, the base has become a focus of much greater attention from NATO than formerly. The recent focus, if not obsession, of NATO generals has become the 64-mile stretch of land. Um, but, oh, well, there you go. That's 64 to 45, depending on how, if you want to cut a straight line. Um, 64 mile stretch of land between Kaliningrad and Belarus, no, or Belarus, as known as the Slovakia Gap. You can pass through it if you drive from Warsaw to Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania, as we did in 2010. To NATO generals, this corridor where enemy forces could cut off the Baltic states um, from NATO support is as important as it was in the Cold War era's Fulda Gap in Germany. Then Fulda, at the Hess Thurgian border, was the two critical invasion routes where a critical hypothetical tank battle with Russia was the fundamental part of NATO military planning. And that's the end of this short report. Um, but since, of course, 2018, during this time's publication, um, its naval presence has grown significantly, both in terms of radar listening stations and submarines with the capacity to just simply just be there. Um, and the fact that this is a nuclearized enclave, I think, does illustrate just the heavy amount of strategic importance here. I think a lot of what we've seen in the last 10 years has been a lot of dusting off of old NATO Cold War strategy about just how important this area is. Yeah, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, you may have mentioned this already, so forgive me, you and your, uh, our listeners, if I'm if I if I missed it. It is uh, the location of Russia's entire uh, Baltic fleet. So it's you know all the the, the naval uh, assets are concentrated there as well. Yeah, that's that's correct. This is outside. This is their ability, basically, to go around all of Europe is through the Baltics into the Atlantic into the North Sea um, to go around Europe if need be, and also to connect through the Black Sea and to get access to their warm water port in Syria, uh, the port of Tartus, which you and I have definitely talked about before. So th there's just a lot here in regards to. Um, sort of their naval network and how they're trying to get around to the European continent. But again, um, nothing would probably be more in Russia's geopolitical interest than to probably have a more uh, formalized connection from, say, Transnistria all the way to Kaliningrad. But um, another reason why this uh, I, I find this piece of land to be relatively important, um, and I'm going to bring up a, a topographical map because I think this is important for us to have a, a good understanding is um, this is relatively flat compared to other parts of Europe uh, in the same way that the folded gap was a relatively flat area of land that uh, many had prophesized tanks would be rolling through. But um, we're going to share on screen now this topographical map of Europe. And as you can see up here, this is where we've got the uh, Baltic NATO states. And this little land right here where my uh, magnifying cursor is at, this is where Kaliningrad is. So already you can see in comparison to, say, you know, the Pyrenees, parts of the Swiss Alps, or even down below the natural border with the Black Sea, and here's Crimean Peninsula, that you have a relatively flat stretch of land um, that would connect Kaliningrad from Belarus. So just an area of importance to understand that for land transportation uh, and any hypothetical military invasion or battle, this is more or less flat, hilly, but very re relatively flatter compared to say the rest of Western and um, the rest of Europe as we get closer towards the Balkans. And it's important to emphasize here that this all has to be seen again, you know, this, but to just to hammer the point, this all has to be seen as a whole uh, picture, you know, as their uh, uh, NATO and um, Ukraine and Russia are in conflict uh, down in the western and northern areas of the Black Sea, um, we see at the same time this kind of uh, poking and prodding 
uh, up in this area of the Baltics. Um, and we have the discussion about uh, Finland and Sweden coming online as NATO allies, which would uh, basically this would um, serve to bring more pressure to bear on uh, Russia up here in the area of the Baltics, because with Sweden uh, coming online and uh, Gotland and everything right around there, um, if Sweden becomes a NATO member too, rather than simply cooperating with NATO, then those straits that run past where Denmark juts up um, become a way to try to um, to uh, bottleneck uh, Russia into the Baltic there and keep their fleet uh, stuck. And then you can see up uh, up further north there with uh, Finland, uh, how its coast projects southward there into that uh, area that leads uh, further up into these uh, Russian ports that are not open year round. So, you know, some of the stuff that I've seen from... Um, from officials from you know lithuania talking about what they've been doing you know very often they'll be like well we are not doing anything really this is just uh we're implementing uh russian sanctions uh excuse me EU, eu sanctions which were just planned and we're only partially stopping the movement of their goods to kaliningrad you know um and it's only some things you know it's like iron from the sanctions and the rest but this is fundamentally a blockade and from and despite the fact that all these people on television like to move their mouths and flap their faces and talk about how, oh, it's Russia's overreacting. They're just trying to push back on sanctions and create a sense that they must be removed. When you consider that uh, they're talking about bringing Finland and Sweden in and they're doing things like beginning to tighten up on the Suvalki Gap and then put that together with all the things that have been going on in uh, the Black Sea area, you can see how um, Russia is not just a, a lady protesting too much. You know, it seems it seems that uh, there's certainly a basis for them to uh, have the perception that they're increasingly seeing these encroachments and these more and more sort of brazen attempts by uh, NATO to say, you ain't got to like it. Yeah. And uh, while the question over whether or not I, I have I need to, to follow back up, the last I had read was that uh, with Finland and Sweden seriously considering the EU membership, that they're still trying to work something out because Turkey had made the objection. And I thought rather, uh, dare I say, prudently uh, to make the objection about uh, entering their situation, especially when uh, Turkey itself has its own geopolitical uh, issues when it comes to their relationship to Russia and being a NATO member. Uh, remember that Turkey has invoked, and Turkey's down here, that in regards to getting from the Black Sea out into the Mediterranean, they did invoke the 1936 Montreux Convention. Basically, they told the West no military vessels are going to enter. Uh, we can let uh, Russian and other shipping out of the Black Sea. Um, but we're, we're not going to try and let the situation escalate. So Turkey, of course, has its own interests, not to mention what's currently happened in Armenia and Azerbaijan, and Turkey's alleged in, you know, influence and um, positions in what happened last year in Kazakhstan, and not to mention their ongoing efforts inside Syria with Russia um, and their own activities against um, the, the Kurds in the uh, Turkish-Syrian border to the north. So there's a lot that Turkey has at stake when it comes to Russia, and we should probably revisit that one of these days in the future, but they've been our, the biggest objectors to the Sweden and, and Finland coming out. But again, to go back to that map, right up here where my cursor is, this is where you've got, you know, Kronstadt, um, known for its port and its saint, but, you know, it's, it's frozen for a good chunk of the year. I mean, icebreakers help, but this is your warm water port, incredibly militarized, nuclearized, and um, it, this is the geopolitical question for a lot of EU and NATO states is, well, the Baltics could easily be cut off, and this is why that gap has become so important once again in the wake of these sanctions that have come out of uh, Lithuania. But um, this sort of brings us now to sort of talking about that belt that, um, that uh, Oliver was just mentioning. And uh, I brought with me, well, I have it in front of me, but uh, this is a book that Oliver had recommended to me and that I'm going to recommend to all of you as uh, to read, which is the Strategic Atlas. I'm sure you're very happy to know that I did buy a copy. Um, so this is the revised edition, but uh, came out, what, 91, right? Still a very incredibly good book, a great way to understand your way to look at the world geospatially. So by all means, if you don't have a copy, you should buy it. 
But there are two, well, really, I would say three men that I think that this uh, this pretty little belt of Russia comes into mind. Um, primarily that of Mr. Mackinder, Mr. Speakman, and Mr. Kennan. So Mackinder and Speakman, most importantly, praise the folly, and I did a stream on this a while back, I think two months ago, that sort of discussed these theories, both of the Heartland and the Rimland. Um, so Heartland was come up by Mackinder, but later Speakman would add to it as to, to why these are so important. I'm going to bring up a map now to sort of illustrate what that looks like um, for you guys. So we are, are aware of what exactly the hell I'm talking about, not just these weird far off names that are that you may not have an idea of. But here we go. So uh, this is uh, Speakman's idea. So this is the heartland. This is an area that was not accessible by the sea powers of the world, sort of borrowing off the ideas of, you know, the influence of sea power upon world history from Mahan, that nations like the United States or the United Kingdom are inherently sea-based powers, that the United States is, for lack of a better term, an island by its access to both coasts and relatively weak neighbors to the north and south, that its main projection would be to the sea because it's so geographically isolated. But you really can't get too far up here into the north due to the ice and your ability to project power navally there. So your focus, of course, is this is the heartland. This is what makes, you know, land wars so difficult is that you have to go through the Rimland. And of course, this is uh, Spike, uh, Speakman's idea. And again, as you can kind of see already um, where the Rimland is and your Rimland is the way into the heartland and how the heartland has its ability to project power outward. So as we can kind of tell where my little, uh, we'll zoom in here, right there, of course, where my cursor is, there's, there's Kronstadt, there's, and there's uh, Kaliningrad right there. So you can already see how this area is important to have easy access to the heartland, and by extension, Moscow and the military and government leadership of Russia. Yeah, if they punch through that, it's a, it's a, it's it's pretty quick and they've also got the you know the opportunities to try to um you know cut uh, russia off there whether it's coming out of that gulf south of uh, finland or whether it's there at the straits um between uh, denmark and uh, sweden and norway um you know they have a lot of ways to try to put that pressure on russia despite the fact that they do have a, a by comparison with anyone else in the world a huge icebreaker fleet you know i think we have one or two you know, maybe Canada's got one or two, but uh, Russia has uh, many, many of them, and they've been working on increasing them um, because of the, the the natural resources in the Ar Arctic, the possibility of trade routes opening up there, and uh, also for uh, for reasons of defense. Yeah, and um, they're also the only ones that have nuclear-powered icebreakers. The United States is still a few years behind from getting any out in deployment. The Russians already have one that is ready to go, and they've got five more that are already in the works. But they have far more diesel-powered icebreakers than the United States does or her allies that it could lend itself onto. So um, in, in the future, that northern part of the heartland that you see on screen is something that will be worth paying attention to in the future. And if you want to know more about, um, I, I can already see that in chat, people are asking questions about icebreakers. I have already got a presentation already done for you guys. It's from last summer, so it's about a year old now. It was the last uh, Sunday stream I did before my transplant. But that one will tell you all about uh, Russia, America, and the Atlantic Council, or yeah, the Arctic Council, excuse me, and their icebreaking capabilities. But um, yeah, it's absolutely true. And one, uh, oh, one thing to quickly throw in, as you pointed out, I just want to make sure everybody understands it. Again, I know you know. Um, when when people do a search, they'll often be like, how many icebreakers does Russia have? And they'll come up with a number like six. As Prude said, those are, and and I don't know how many are currently in use or how current that is, but, um, but those are nuclear icebreakers. They've got considerably more of ones that are not nuclear powered. So um, yeah, it's far more than uh, than six. Yeah, because there's a difference between the diesel ones that we've been using for decades in comparison to the more nuclear power technology that the Russians have been um, testing and, and, and fielding out. The Americans are beginning to do the same as well. But again, refer back to the icebreaker stream. It's about the Arctic and why we should be paying attention to the Arctic in the future, especially as uh, sea ice begins to break up. There will be avenues for trade and resource extraction. So the Arctic Council, Russia, Canada, and America are really going to be major players in the future when it comes to that. So something to definitely keep in mind. But 
Yeah, so uh, I'm going to read a little bit here from the book that, again, everyone should be reading or have a copy of. Um, this is I'm, Semi-Agog is the guy to go to for a book recommendation. Um, I can't begin to tell you how many times he's harangued me or just chats in general about which books to read, which I'm always appreciative when he does because he's never given me a bad recommendation. But uh, here we go. So this is uh, this little page is called The Geopoliticians. Um, so the German geographer Friedrich Ratzel, author of Politische Geography in 1897, developed a number of basic concepts, particularly concerning space, that have inspired geopoliticians. It was British writer H. Mackinder who in 1904 proposed the notion that the continental part of Eurasia, by its virtue of its land mass, forms the world heartland. According to Mackinder, and of course I have one of the maps up here on screen for you all, who several times had revised his geographical delimination of the heartland, both in 1919 and 1943, as you can see on screen. Um, the power who controls this landmass, once potentially Germany, now the Soviet Union, threatens the sea powers, once Great Britain, and now the United States, that controls the world island, that is, by extension, our planet. The factors that Mackinder came to include in his thinking developed were communications, including aviation, population, and industrialization. In 1943, he repudiated his 1919 theory, stating that the heartland will dominate the world island. The American, of course, as we've talked about before with Alfred Thayer Mahan, which Praise the Folly and I talked about a few weeks back, um, before, the world was, uh, before the word was invented of geopolitics, put forward, of course, in 1900, the problem of Asia and its effect upon international politics. The idea that world hegemony of sea powers can be maintained by control of a series of bases around the Eurasian continent. This view foreshadowed Mackinder's concept of the world island. Now, um, the problem of Asia and its effect on international uh, politics, I don't know if you can even get a hold of a, an actual hard copy, but I know there's um, PDFs of it online. But I'll, I'll reiterate this line here. The idea that the world hegemony of sea powers can be maintained by a control of series of bases around the Eurasian continent. Well, hmm, kind of makes you think of whether or not that old, uh, old style geopolitics is still there, because... Let's see, here's the Rimland, and uh, there's the Heartland itself, and where are all of our military bases? Where have we been stationed around the world? Um, we've got, basically, it's like air bases versus icebreakers, because let's see, we're all over in the Rimland, of course, in Europe, um, and our allies over to the western part of the continent, and of course, we've been heavily involved in the Middle East, down below, we have bases in Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, and we have an interest in Japan, Korea, and the Pacific, and of course, we're engaged with, and I'm going to scroll the map down to, for a little more context. Or, there we go. Um, of course, we're now trying to engage in a broad spectrum Asian alliance, whether it's against the Chinese, but also with Russia in mind, with the Quad, which is, of course, uh, the United States, India, uh, Australia, United States, India, Australia, and I believe Japan is the fourth nation. And um, this administration, for better or worse, has sent its uh, laughable vice president. Uh, out to East Asia to try and incur support. Most recently, Kamala Harris, earlier um, this year, I believe was in Vietnam, and uh, trying to incur a better relationship there, visited some POW memorial with regards to John McCain. Um, he had a memorial there, but yeah, th that's what's been currently going on. So I think that we're seeing a lot of these old style late um, 19th century geopolitical thinkers. Uh, their, their shadow still stands over us today. Yes, it all uh, does seem to come together. I recall that in that book, uh, The Strategic Atlas, there are a couple of pages that show, of course, though they're dated from that time period. There are a couple pictures that show, I think it's an Arctic uh, projection, and it shows the distribution of the uh, U.S. bases at that time just like you're talking about, about how they're, you know, positioned all the way around Russia in order to uh, serve as a containment. And those sorts of graphics are, um, are pretty striking when you see them. That's, that's one of the best things about that book, which as it happens, uh, was, was, uh, was recommended to me by my old friend, Tim years ago. I think I bought my first copy in like 95 or something. Um, but yeah, they're, the, the projections are one of the best things about 
that book because it shows you the way in which different projections for different regions viewed by different countries lead them to see the world in different ways. You know, so if you take a look at um, a Mercator projection, it's going to increase the apparent size of things um, in areas like Europe to make them seem uh, much larger. They'll make things like Africa seem much smaller, you know, and if you're in the United States, you'll uh, very often be looking at a map that short, sort of shows the U.S. centrally positioned, you know, whereas other countries will arrange their full world maps with them in the center. Um, but it's specifically when you take a look at um, Russia that the Arctic projections come into their own. Because if you're used to looking at that big horizontal map of a Mercator projection, it's can... very different. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, basically the way in which Russia is surrounded only becomes apparent when you look at Arctic projections that show that the U.S. is basically blocking them um, to their, you know, to what would seem to be the north, of course, of, of, of a Mercator projection. But when you look at it as Arctic, you see that they're actually, they're surrounded on all sides, you know, when you consider Canada and their relationship with uh, NATO and other Western powers. Although I, I like what Charlemagne had to say in chat. He says, this is why you use a globe. <laughs> that's, that's a matter of fact. And that's yeah. that's something I, I need. I need a high quality globe here soon. But I'll tell you what, to get a decent one costs some money. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was, I, I've been told. <laughs> even even old style ones. I was in an antique store the other day. Um, in, in, uh, well, I won't say where. But anyways, there was a, a really detailed it's really large. It was from 1965. And I'm sure it's also more expensive because of its age where I mean, like you could still see colonial holdings on the map. But I mean, man, that thing was like three hundred and eighty five dollars for this really large, you know, um, detailed globe. It kind of does tell you um, the price of having good cartography. Yeah, mighty and powerful stuff that all gentlemen need represented in their uh, in their studies. And I'm not talking about some dumb nonsense like uh, Forgotten Weapons uses where the top of his globe comes off and it's a bar. That is that is uh, nonsense. No, no proper gentleman would allow his uh, geopolitical um, tools to be, you know, to double up as being a place where they hide their liquor. Nonsense. <laughs> a true a true gentleman would have his bar sitting off on one side as a proper bar. That is absolutely correct. Um, and I, to, to, as we were talking about these uh, these Heartland and Rimland theories, I, I did have another article that um, I'm going to come up. This is from Purdue University, but I, I would like to discuss, uh, this is from Sloan's Geopolitics, Geography, and Strategic History, which is a part of um, Rutledge's Geopolitical Theories series. But uh, I'm just going to just read a few lines here where he says... Um, the current events in the 21st century have illustrated that the geopolitical theories of Halford Mackinder and Nicholas Speakman remain relevant today in regards to history and strategy. British foreign policy in the heartland and the roles of these um, concepts involving Britain in the Battle of the Atlantic and the emergence of geopolitics in the United States after the Second World War illustrates that even after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, um, it continues to show that the Rimlin theory of, of geopolitics remains relevant, both with the rise of China and the um, Russian Federation's growth and expansion as a reemerging global power. Um, and so I think to us, it does illustrate some of these old 19th century thinkers still very relevant today. Wise, wise men. Yeah, because, I mean, obviously, as you well know, um, the geography doesn't change. I mean, barring some sort of truly apocalyptic, you know, coastline shift or something, um, the the strong points are the strong points. You know, from the period of the damn Sarmatians and Persians, Darbent, the Iron Gates, you know, is a northward passage around the uh, the eastern portions of the Caucasus. You know, um, no matter what, the Georgian military highway is a year round passage where Russia can get through the central Caucasus to Russia. Um, running from Vladikavkaz south ever since the days that uh, Yermolov had it built. And so when you take a look at uh, what happened in South Ossetia in 2008, you understand that that's actually all about the Georgian military highway and year-round access uh, south through the Caucasus. Again, things that you are very well aware of, but I want to make sure that our, our audience you know, is following the fact that it's the timelessness of the, of the board 
the game board on which all of this is played that ensures that, you know, while some things might change, it might become less important when you have cruise missiles uh, that Turkey could shut off the uh, the Bosphorus. Uh, nevertheless, though, you know, the, 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 the quantity of the importance of these regions may go up or down. The qualitative aspects of how they shape interactions and amount to weaknesses or strong points, these things uh, remain the same. Exactly. And it does really illustrate why these things are still standing the test of time. Like you said, these things don't change. The rhetoric might change from politicians and leaders. And again, this is why you're here instead of listening to those, you know, that monk debate. I'll suffer with, with you instead of uh, you guys having to watch it because Michael McFall is not going to talk about the Georgian military highway or that we're interested, of course, in trying to gain, maintain that the heartland does not play, be the area of geopolitical importance that sea powers are. So, you know, these things are very important for us to talk about. But now that we've sort of given you this background on this enclave and the geography and its importance, uh, we're now going to sort of just bring in why the hell we're talking about this gap. And that, of course, has to do, as Semigonka just recently mentioned, that we're real dealing with these uh, EU sanctions that uh, Lithuania has imposed. So I'm going to, and of course, always use archive.today when you're discussing um, the mainstream press, because otherwise um, you're giving them clicks and views and ad revenue. So let's not do that. But this is from the New York Times, and you're going to get a biased perception as every journalist does. And I'm sure we all have our own biases. But this was from uh, yesterday on the 25th. A sleepy Baltic rail line gets a geopolitical wake up call. Russia has accused Lithuania, a NATO member, of choking off a flow of goods to Kaliningrad, its enclave on the Baltic, as a part of a sanctions over the war in Ukraine. Lithuania says Russia is lying. Well, imagine that. Um, but here we go. As war rages on in Ukraine, fueling, uh, fueling ever-growing tensions between NATO and Russia, a sleepy Baltic railway station with no passengers and a few trains this week found itself at the center of a perilous new confrontation between East and West. The station stands on the border between Lithuania, a NATO member and a strong supporter of Ukraine, and Kaliningrad, a Russian ex uh, enclave on the Baltic Sea, stuffed with nuclear-capable missiles but physically disconnected from the rest of Russia. From Lithuania's town of Kerabatai, um, uh, decked with Ukrainian flags, the railway tracks extend west into Kaliningrad, bringing the goods into the region, but also tracing a potentially volatile strategic fault line over the edge of Europe. And here's our our lovely little rail line here from uh, Vilnius, the capital of Lithuania. Here's the town in question right there on the border between Kaliningrad, um, Oblast, and the nation. And right below, would you look at that? There's our, uh, there's our gap. And this uh, rail line is just right above heading straight into Belarus. Um, kind of an important thing for us to keep in mind. And you can already tell by the scale here, this is a very short amount of space here. Um, one of my favorite lines growing up as a kid, and I'm sure you probably are familiar with the saying too, semi agog is, is that, you know, um, in America, a hundred years may seem like a, a long time ago, but to Europeans, a hundred miles may seem like forever just to talk about, you know, distance and driving. So things to definitely keep in mind. Yeah, I know, son of heaven. I, we're terrible at pronouncing foreign names. It's uh, it's the Anglophone curse at that point. My apologies for butchering it. I will from now on do my discussion of these <laughs> names in a uh, vaguely Slavic accent because you have to do so. Uh, it's just part of it. But anyways, uh, to continue on with the article... Uh, this week, long dormant tensions over Kaliningrad erupted, further fraying Russia's relations to the West um, after, and this is where the article goes on, after unfounded claims by Moscow that Europe was choking off train and trucking routes by bringing vital supplies to Kaliningrad and would, as a result, face retaliation. Um, so far, what retaliation is to come, we have yet to see. Um, however, since the sanctions have started, there have been live fire naval military exercises in the Baltic Sea by the Russian Navy. Um, but so far, I'm not sure if there has been any sort of counter sanctions or any real retaliatory ways and means. I mean, I, and we'll get into that and as to why in a little bit. Um, but to continue on, Russia will certainly respond to such hostile action. Nikolai P. Petrushev, the head of Kremlin Security Council and one of President Vladimir Putin's closest advisors, warned this last Tuesday during a visit to Kaliningrad. He said Russia would take measures in the near future 
that will have serious negative impact on the population of Lithuania. Uh, the threat set off a frantic scramble by Washington and the other European capitals to head off something that they have sought to avoid since Mr. Putin invaded Ukraine four months ago, a direct confrontation between Russia and NATO. And on Wednesday, Lithuanian ministers and legislators gather, gathered in a secure underground conference room to game out a possible Russian response and discuss how the dry minutia of European sanctions had set off such a rush of unintended and possibly dangerous consequences. Um... I don't know if I would say that this is, you know, unintended consequences. I mean, historically, we know both from the Second World War, but throughout all of really the 19th and 20th centuries, how important this, uh, you know, uh, this gap is and this transportation to, to Kaliningrad has been, especially for Russia's access to the Baltics, especially post-91. I wouldn't say it's unintended in the slightest, um, but, you know, they always say that, you know, how could they imagine the possible consequences, despite knowing that this is one of the most militarized areas in all of Europe? Yeah, and Russia has obviously um, uh, had their eyes on this for quite some time. You know, you take a look at uh, uh, Moldova and Transnistria. It's uh, formerly Bessarabia, which for quite some time was a uh, Russian possession. And clearly after 1991, they anticipated this could be a problem. So they created uh, intentionally a frozen conflict in uh in uh, transnistria there in moldova to keep it locked up and uh they uh you know they kept their uh kaliningrad uh exclave and uh they've created these frozen conflicts uh elsewhere in order to maintain sort of their minimum possible uh defensive posture that still covers their bases more or less you know so they've got crimea because of just absolutely absurd nonsense by the west they created an opportunity for Russia to um, to flip their historical enemies, the Abkhazians, who were you know among the Caucasian tribes, more or less almost uh, annihilated in some cases, fully annihilated in other cases, like the Ubich. Um, these are former enemies of the Russians, and yet Russia has turned Abkhazia around and defended their claims against Georgia. So they've got Abkhazia, they've got um, they've got the Crimean Peninsula. Now they've got you know, much of uh, Eastern and Southern Ukraine. Uh, they've got Transnistria, they've got Kaliningrad, they've got uh, things frozen with uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. You know, and these obviously are um, kind of interesting little spots where things just flare up. We're, we're supposed to imagine, uh, as, as uh, Charlemagne said, it's charming the idea that we don't want direct conflict. We're supposed to imagine that there's no direct conflict between the West or at least NATO and Russia. And yet NATO backed Turkey intervened to um, push Azerbaijan to go after um, uh, Russian backed Armenia. You know, NATO is, you know, doing all the, the the crazy things it's doing in Ukraine right now. And now we've got this pressure uh, up in the north. So, again, yeah, the idea that we don't want this conflict and it's just something that Russia's doing is perhaps the most preposterous uh, narrative line that we've seen unspooled. Uh, with all of this. And in many respects, it's almost insulting how stupid the uh, assumptions they would expect you to accept uh, are. Yeah. And I, my favorite line from Charlemagne over the, la over the course of this entire ordeal has been that America's conception of proxy war is that, you know, unless it's some guy named John Q America, that's actually doing it, then it's not us. Um, despite the fact that, you know, we've been supplying aid and munitions and, you know, signing a $40 billion check and treating like it's the new Lend-Lease Act, you know, it's not us. Um, <laughs> no, nobody here but us chickens. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but they say that nobody... Um, this is this is again this is the interest this line right here kind of says it all nobody wanted or expected any of this says the chairman of the lithuanian's defense and security committee we all know how sensitive kaliningrad is for the russians but we're gonna <laughs> we know we never want nobody wanted or expected any of this but we also know how sensitive this is um so just yeah to... and and if i remember correctly the entire population of all of these baltic countries put together and i think lithuania is the one with the biggest of uh populations but they're all uh together they come to like six million people um you know they're just the the populations are very very small by the standards of you know what we think about with western european countries or with the united states and the rest yeah it's a it's a, a small group of people who just it's, it's kind of like, um, 
I don't know. It's kind of like a, it's a small uh, group of dogs and I'm not, I'm not dissing the Baltic states or their interest in maintaining their own, uh, national sovereignty. Like I'm not taking a position there, but the woof, woof, woofing coming out of, uh, countries is, uh, you know, the biggest of them, Lithuania and other ones that are smaller. Um, it just seems like small dogs yapping at a bear. And this sort of reemphasizes why, again, to, to refer back to our favorites, right? The, the Mearsheimers and Waltz of the world, when you are a smaller power, when you are, when your borders are the way that they are and your population is less than the 3 million, your options are limited. Both, and, and this is why, you know, Stephen Walt says that smaller powers, in this instance, like Lithuania, population of about 2.8 million people, you're left with few choices, which is either to engage in strong economic ties to increase the likelihood that you're in someone's good favor, and also pursue ways to provide for the defense of your sovereignty as a nation, which in this instance has been pursuing relations through the European Union and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So, the things that the realist school tells us, they happen the way that they do. Um, explanatory power. Yeah, and the the other thing is, I just I'm in endlessly um, uh, annoyed by how little information anyone actually supplies regarding this stuff. Like I watched one of these just horrific. I mean, I'd not recommend you watch anything from DW. I think it's a Deutsche Welle or whatever. Um, they had some woman who was supposed to be the uh, the 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 area expert who was speaking about what's going on in Lithuania and said less than nothing. All she did was kick sand backwards in the cat box rhetorically and mouth a sequence of nothings regarding uh, what's happening here. You know, they don't tell you that uh, some of these countries like Lithuania have significant Russian populations as minorities. They, they, they don't tell you about all the historical aspects that you've been covering. Um, they don't tell you, for example, that uh, there's a serious political tension uh, in these places and that Russia, because of its long relationships with these countries, and I hope to go over some of this later this week with, uh, with praise of folly, um, they have uh, all kinds of tendrils in these countries. So right at the time that this is going on with the Ukraine, <clears throat> you have odd things beginning to happen with some of these governments and their coalitions breaking down. You know, there's all kinds of stuff going on with uh, with Estonia. Um, there's all kinds of uh, problems now with uh, with Bulgaria um, and where they do have uh, what seems to be control. Uh, that is to say, Western backed um installed uh, leadership. Usually you'll see that it'll be a female. And every time they appear, they spend half the time talking to congratulating them about how they're the first woman prime minister, which is always a sign that the EU or NATO has installed someone, you know, um, these things, uh, they're, they're on a knife's edge, you know? So when you look at a thing like uh, Bulgaria trying to form a coalition government again, again, we'll talk more about this in a stream on my channel later, but I want to make sure it's on the board for everyone. Turkey, trying to thread a needle, even as a NATO country, not, not wanting to maybe go too far with some things like, yeah, they're probably trying to exact concessions, certainly trying to exact concessions from, uh, NATO and EU countries before they sign off on anything like Sweden coming on, you know, they're like, well, maybe we'll do Finland, but Sweden, you know, backs the Kurds. So we don't want to do that. Right. Turkey's being careful watching and waiting what's going to happen with Russia, because if Russia comes out very much ahead in Ukraine, which all signs indicate they will at this point, then uh, uh, Turkey is going to be confronting a new geopolitical reality. Moldova, likewise, is going to be confronting a new geopolitical reality if uh, the Russians continue from where they are in areas like Kherson and cross over to um, to uh, the, the, the areas by Odessa and connects with uh, Transnistria. That at that point, they would be controlling the mouths of the uh, Danube, if I'm not mistaken, and certainly the Dniester, which are very important rivers for industry and uh, trade and uh, transit all the way up into uh, Central Europe. Uh, Moldova's situation will be changed enormously if Russia connects overland to uh, Transnistria. Um, Bulgaria's situation is likely to be changed because of gas flows that run through there. You know, NATO has dumped all kinds of effort and attention into uh, Romania, but uh, we'll have to see just how stable all that is or isn't after we see what unfolds in uh, Ukraine. That being my point, that, that they don't 
talk to you about how there's so much tension within these countries. You know, you have leaders that get installed more or less, you know, they're like, oh, well, everything was corrupt before. So now we're on a path to EU membership. And um, which is another thing that's happened now with them saying Moldova is now a candidate. Ukraine is now a candidate. You know, um, Georgia is uh, soon to be mm, moving along as a candidate. It's not quite as far. Um, but it, after we see what happens in the Ukraine, the facts the facts, the reality on the ground is going to change significantly. And at that point, lots of these installed governments who who basically kick out anyone who disagrees with them, kick out anyone who wants to maintain positive or at least neutral relationships with Russia, the interior situations in those countries, um, it's likely to change very, very much when everybody sees what side their bread is actually buttered on vis-a-vis -vis the facts on the ground with Russia and places uh, like Ukraine. So there's there's an enormous amount going on here in terms of trying to shape the game board and what's going on in Europe. And most of these fools, uh, the so-called experts, are not discussing uh, any of it, unless you 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 dig into weird little recondite areas. Otherwise, you you've got to come to a channel like Prudes to get any of th this information. Yeah, and the same reason why people subscribe to you as well. I mean, this is we have to dig through it so everyone can at least have some essence of information. But um, while I, that article is also on here, and this is the little interesting line that is in, actually here, right down below. This article is just yesterday. Um, trucks held on the Russian side of the border with Lithuania. Uh, this week, Lithuania asked the European Commission, basically what our, our, the decision-making body here of implementing rules in the EU, um, to, uh, to rule exactly how and when sanctions on Russian goods should be applied. So really, the, the Lithuanians had done something, and now they're sort of waiting for, um, they, they've sort of passed the buck to the European Commission on how they want this applied. And by extension, I'm sure there will be some uh, American input on there as well. And the reason why I find this to be such a, a particularly interesting thing to take place is because Lithuania, along with a few of the other Baltic states, uh, have been trying to lessen their dependence in the ways in which Russia has a little more um, energy leverage over Western Europe. Um, so... Uh, in 2015, Lithuania, if I recall correctly, joined Estonia and Latvia from uh, breaking away from a sort of a 2001 agreement that would basically have Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania in sort of this Russian energy ring for Russian supplies, orienting their energy grids to the Western Europe and the, the rest of the continent instead. And in 2010, they've uh, been focusing a lot more on energy independence themselves. And I think that they've used this war um, to more or less sort of suspend their Russian gas imports and try to be uh, alone on themselves. They don't take as much of, um, they don't require as much as, say, Germany does. Or, uh, I mean, for instance, Germany imported last year around, what, 140 some odd billion cubic meters of of gas, whereas they barely need anything. I think it's, uh, let me see if I can find a source. Um, 2.8 billion cubic meters of gas uh, in 2014 is what they had imported. Um, and their population- and that's, that's leaving aside oil, you know, that's yeah, just yeah, gas. That's just, that's natural gas, right? Because um, back in 2014, almost all of their gas came from Russia. And Lithuania's population, just for consideration, right? Um, its population is 2.8 million. That's barely a third of the city of London. Um, just important things to, to conceptualize and sense of scale here. Yeah, we've got to definitely got to um, increase the numbers of Pakistani in, uh, in, in Lithuania. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there'll be more diversification to come. Uh, but th these things are to keep to keep in mind in the back of your head as we try and conceptualize these areas that seem like far off middle of nowhere places with a sparse population. These are some of the most important geopolitical areas in the world. We have to pay attention um, because even if we want to call things great power politics, there are always going to be these smaller parts of the world that are at bay that we need to understand. And even then when we talk about, oh, that they're trying to stop, you know, Russian gas imports, we, as we know from earlier uh, last month from the Wall Street Journal, that a lot of Russian oil and natural gas imports are still happening despite sanctions. 
They're just going through different ways, different shipping routes under different listings and on different cargo ships. And um, yet, and yet they're causing enormous uh, trouble just with the, these hiccups and the weird routes that they have to take to get around things. And did to, correct? I didn't mean to cut you off, but no, uh, you're fine. I, I think it bears here. Uh, didn't I see on Twitter today something about how all these countries are now coming online in the EU and saying that they're not going to be able to meet these, you know, 2035 gasless society, no more, you know, gas powered car type uh, targets. I mean, and and then they're they're making up uh, for lost uh, energy uh, capacity due to uh, things being cut off from Russia. Places like Germany are now producing their electricity from coal. Yep. It's like it's I, I mean, the you know, I just flash giant clown, giant world, you know, icons on screen. <laughs> it's just it's ridiculous. Yeah, I did read today that the Germans were reopening a lot of their coal-based, uh, their their coal fire plants to, to produce energy, um, while at the same time they are still following with all the, uh, you know, Muti Merkel's plans to denuclearize the country because she tried to outflank the Greens from the left during her time in politics. So just it does illustrate some of the. Uh, sort of the short term thinking, I think, in pursuit of these lofty ideas that you're thinking. not you, Yeah, thinking, right? You can't you can't antagonize. Um you're you can't bite the hand that feeds you in some regards. And then but again, it's the regular people like us who suffer paying, you know, ridiculous amounts because our governments didn't plan uh, you know plan ahead. Or or did plan to screw or, us yeah, or in did. precisely this way. Yeah. In precisely this way to screw us over. So that, that's where I, I was always interested in the speculation as to what might come from this, because uh, the liquid natural gas and the natural gas pipelines that, you know, have been used with effective leverage over the continent, the Baltic states have been trying to separate themselves now for years. But um, there is to put some uh, info here in regards to the, uh, the uh, camera or the sort of the positioning of NATO troops. Uh, Peter Nielsen, a Danish colonel commanding a NATO unit in Vilnius, in the Lithuanian capital, said that he sees no signs in recent days that Russia is preparing for any new military action against Lithuania. I didn't sleep very well in the month up to the Ukraine invasion. Now I sleep very well, he said in an interview. Touch wood. I, 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 I'm sure that that has to be an interesting translation um, from Dutch. I, <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Hmm. It, it, he probably means knock on wood. The yeah, same probably. But, but touch wood. Touch, Touch wood sounds a little too bathhousey for me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you want to touch grass, but you find a man, I guess. Um, <laughs> uh, what Russia might ultimately do, he added, will depend on the mind of Mr. Putin, and we can't look into that. But the Russian president's capacity to act short of initiating nuclear war is severely limited. Uh, we're tracking what they do, not what they say. And around half of Russian troops and hardware that has been previously based in Kaliningrad, for example, has now been redeployed to Ukraine. The United States, in contrast, has boosted NATO forces in Lithuania, with around 700 American soldiers now on rotation in the country to supplement a regular contingent of 1,150 German, 250 Dutch, and 200 Norwegian troops. This, said Colonel Nielsen, makes a Russian military strike against Lithuania highly unlikely, even if they are crazy. Um, and I do think that I mean, the Russian government, I, I think, is at least rational enough uh, to sort of know that the any sort of NATO-Russian engagement would most likely escalate to that kind of ballistic missile conflict that nobody wants. And if I remember correctly, um, there was a massive uh, Baltic NATO exercise that was supposed to take place here recently, and it was uh, it was postponed and did not happen. Uh, as a result of the uh, the coup, so uh, and, and by comparison, I believe that there was a big Russian exercise that just a couple of years earlier than this last one I mentioned was supposed to happen, and I think it was titled West in some Russian word, and uh, and they did undertake their exercises, whereas uh, the the Baltic the the allies and the Baltic nations were not able to uh, to run theirs, which is uh, kind of interesting. You know, they they did not have the chance to do their massive, um, you know, integrated military exercise to make sure that they could do these things. Whereas Russia, just a couple of years before that was supposed to happen, uh, did do so. 
Yeah, not to mention that, you know, when there was the issue of migrants on the Poland-Belarusian border, that the Russians had no problem deploying rather quickly their own military forces alongside the Belarusians, just to illustrate that, you know, whatever happens between Poland and Belarus to resolve this migrant issue, it has the backing of the Russian state and more or less gave the Russians the necessary strategic positioning they needed for any future events that would take place. And again, this was before, this was last year in November around the Thanksgiving time frame for us in the States. So they kind of managed to secure a necessary strategic position and exercise how quickly they could deploy um, before, you know, what happened in February. We'll just have to wait and see what happens with uh, Ukraine. I cannot emphasize enough that, you know, this this whole business of NATO and how they'll back everything. And once you're in uh, once you're in NATO and in, in the EU, you're quote unquote safe. Um, I think we are we have to watch closely what happens here, because as it becomes apparent that, you know, e even if it's indirectly, you know, the amount of money and support, the weapons and the logistical and intelligence backing and the advising that is doubtless going on you know, relative to Western countries, uh, NATO and the EU and Ukraine, you know, we could say, oh, it's not a direct conflict, but the, the, all of the energy and effort going into backing Ukraine against Russia here. Um, and we, you know, with Ukraine, as you well know, we're not talking about a small country and a small army. Um, you, we're, we're, we're going to see whether or not that really does anything. And, and now is the point at which, you know, the, the idea that NATO is so fierce and can back these countries against, uh, Russia, seeing how it plays out on the ground. And again, I cannot emphasize enough once the people in these countries, you know, who, who are, uh, who are a, a kind of like, um, <clears throat> their, their, uh, uh, their conflict within the internal parties and their opposition and the rest, I think you're going to see all of that come forward quite a bit you know a lot of people are going to be like look we still just we need gas we, we need gas to, to to you know and electricity and power and we, we we need energy and you're just cutting us off um and and they're going to see that increasingly as people have said in the chat you know germany is beginning to have e enormous problems and these are just going to run and in, in, in so many different directions and have so many uh implications that we haven't even you know considered the remic the uh all these ramifications and they're, they're running out of money. It's not like any of these countries are coming off of a huge economic boom. We're coming off of all the crap with, uh, with the coof and yeah. they've dumped their, their, uh, their, whatever they had in the way of excess military supplies has been poured into the great crucible of, uh, Ukraine which is great for all kinds of international arms suppliers. Cause now everybody has to buy new stuff, which is great for them. But at precisely the time when they're thinking about possible problems in the Baltics, they've dumped all kinds of excess stuff into Ukraine. Now, probably a lot of that was uh, garbage. You know, I heard things about Stinger missiles where the battery packs didn't work and stuff. I have no way to confirm that, but it would make sense that they'd try to pull their old equipment out and, and, and you know, dump it on Ukraine. But it's, it's not just uh, possible, it's likely that they've got real financial strains and real uh, equipment and uh, logistical strains. And, and this is just with it starting in uh, Ukraine. There can be real problems in Moldova. There could be real problems in Bulgaria. There could be real problems in Estonia. You know, Russian intelligence services have all kinds of options and old relationships in these countries that they spent decades coming to know uh, to infiltrate and to manipulate. Yeah, and it's not only just a boost to say the military industrial complex, as uh, one of famous American generals wrote, war is a racket, but also the simple fact that what a great way to destabilize other future regions of interests. If I were the West and I was just witnessing the terrible capacity of the last 20 years of what kind of arms and weapons can do in countries with you know various terror groups, fundamentalist groups and, you know, wanting to do whatever they want with basically sort of carte blanche, you know, uh, we'll, we'll look the other way in order to cause geopolitical problems for our rivals. Imagine what you can do with that in places like the Balkans or places like the Baltic states, uh, especially now that we've poured so many weapons and arms into Ukraine. And we don't, 
as we always do when it comes to weapons, whether it's to the south of the border, like with Fast and Furious trying to arm the cartels, or what we've done in Iraq and Afghanistan and other parts of the Middle East. I just would, I don't think it's, it's not conjecture to say that these will end up in the hands of terrorist groups and other organizations that may have clandestine support from intelligence services, either from the Russians, the United States, or other powers. Yeah, it's a mess. And uh, people are, you know, the fools who, uh, you know, gobble up the, the, the putrescence that's offered to them on so-called news programs. You know, they, they don't track things that I know you do, like Wagner Group um, operating in Libya in order to ensure that Libya is a frozen conflict and they can't fully uh, leverage the, uh, the energy reserves there and, for example, sell them to Europe because it's a frozen conflict. You know, there are Wagner Group and uh, Russian affiliated or... Uh, connected in some sense uh, organizations and operations going on in the Sahel, which is why you see NATO and the U.S. trying to get down there too. Um, there are all kinds of places that uh, Russia can um, create problems. And this this insistence that everyone has on slobbering out little remarks like their economy is just the size of New York State, you know, is um, is absurd. It causes us to unrealistically imagine that uh, that Russia is a pushover. I'm not saying that they don't have their problems. Uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, if uh, apocalyptic apocalyptic levels of conflicts, uh, conflict emerged that that they couldn't go down to. But um, that's something that we don't want to get anywhere near. And, you know, the the kind of knuckle dragging uh, slobberers who, who, as I said, like to say things like, Oh, it hurt her. The economy is only the size of New York state. They don't, they don't understand any of this. Yeah. And the thing to also keep in mind, this is that any time that you acknowledge, you have to acknowledge when analyzing this, we have to acknowledge the power capacity of rivaling powers and acknowledging the power capacity of states that are aligned with various spheres of influence. That is a part of, of recognizing how sort of this this strategic and geopolitical aspects of the world operates is acknowledging the powers of other of other nations. Um, I didn't. I mean, clearly the the war has dragged on. I think a lot longer than even some of the most ardent supporters of Russia had said. Um, in the same way that it has gone increasingly protracted in ways that even now the uh, Western media has begun to to change their position. And I think that the most clear voices have been those that have tried to realistically estimate both the intelligence and hard power capabilities of of rivaling states but also just reading what these people publish and um there there is a a bit here that came out of um the lithuanian president earlier this week this is on the 23rd of june um and i'm not going to try and pronounce his name to to do this but he had stressed that the baltic country must and will enforce eu sanctions on russian goods amid harsh rhetoric from moscow over vilnius's recent restrictions affecting kaliningrad he called for an urgent start to consultations with the European Commission to protect Lithuania's interests and international obligations in the shadow of sanctions against Ukraine's, quote, aggressor. Russia this week summoned an EU envoy to strongly protest and threatened unspecified retaliation. Um, but so far, we, we don't know what that will look like. Um, there has been a live fire military exercise by the Russian Navy in the Baltic Sea. Um, and the Russians have already said that they will pay additional costs to ship things via air and um through uh, naval shipping so yeah increasing ferry service as well as one of the yep. ones that they're talking about from uh, what i've heard and i don't know much about this you know there's the the implication is that it will be considerably more expensive to you know to bring in things like you know materials necessary for steel manufacture and that kind of thing if they have to do it by shipping but <clears throat> in reality it seems that um you know, uh, Russia will be able to, to resupply Kaliningrad. It's just, this is more of a nuisance. It seems like it's more of a nuisance for Russia and a signal that they won't be left alone. And this, this yapping is going to continue up in the, the area of the Baltic. So, you know, we'll have to see what happens with, uh, with Sweden and Finland. And I think that's going to depend on what Turkey thinks they can get and what they're going to have to do uh, in terms of accommodating their powerful neighbor to the north of Russia. And for that, Turkey is uh, waiting, I think, for, uh, for some sense of what's likely to transpire in Ukraine as it moves forward. The simple fact that, um, that Erdogan has been talking about how he's going to go into Syria, uh, and yet he has not done so thus far, um, 
and Russia continues to make these gains suggests to me that he's he's looking at that kind of thing. So, you know, the Baltic area, things could shift uh, fairly quickly if if, if uh, Ukraine really does start to crumble, particularly in the east, as it seems it's now beginning to do more quickly. It's still a grinding thing. Um, then the reality on the ground could change. Turkey could say, no, I want to have Russia owe me a favor. Um, so I will uh, refuse to um, admit these, uh, you know, Sweden and uh, and Finland and you could see things uh, shift there quite a bit. But again, I think a lot of this is waiting on uh, how, how things uh, eventuate in Ukraine yeah. itself. To, to put Turkey in, into some wider context here, this is the same. Turkey alongside Israel have been spending a lot of their diplomatic capital on trying to facilitate some kind of ceasefire negotiation and also trying to see what concessions that they can get out of Russia as well. Um, not to mention over the course of 2021, Turkey has been involved in regards to Armenia and Azerbaijan and also, you know, alleged to have involvement inside Kazakhstan, Syria. Um, and at the same time, the relationship to the West over the course of the last several years has been tenuous. The United States had withdrew them from or kicked them out of the F-35 sort of uh, joint strike fighter program as a contracted country because they had adopted the S-400, um, you know, air, air surface-to-air missile defense, you know, project from the Russians. While at the same time, uh, this administration, um, once it had taken office in 2021, had called Istanbul, Constantinople, and had acknowledged formally the Armenian genocide. And so that has gone on top of the fact that uh, Erdogan has played the really the $4.2 million Trump card, which is the number of migrants that Turkey has been holding since a 2015 agreement with the European Union. So all of these things in the background that we've talked about in other streams, both Semyagog and myself on this channel and on his, all these things are in the background that all play a role here on how these nations negotiate and try and sway political and economic leverage over each other uh, in towards the future. But uh, we've been going for a little over uh, an hour now. Semyagog was wondering if you wanted to have any um, additional final thoughts uh, towards this area before we get to say some announcements and our favorite concluding thing. Yeah, for me, it's just thank you. Um, for me, it's just this same point that the situation on the ground in Ukraine, um, though it seems like it's all very slow to us, um, it's actually fairly rapid. You know, we're talking about three or four months at this point, if I remember correctly. Um, and uh, the reality of uh, the situation there in the Black Sea um, it will shift considerably, which means all the countries bordering the Black Sea, uh, they will have to they will have to reckon with a different set of circumstances, um, particularly if Russia does move uh, to take Odessa and all basically all of the uh, Black Sea coastline, which would turn you know the western parts of Ukraine into a into a rump state. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, there are a bunch of ways that I could poke at this and talk about it, but I've already sort of covered this the basic idea is w one month from now, circumstances in Ukraine, um, could speak of a reality that's so different than what everyone had hoped for in the black sea, um, that you see real, uh, political struggle, um, fire back up in some of these countries that NATO thought they had, uh, locked down like Bulgaria, right? The yeah. only thing I would add, <clears throat> and I hope to cover some of this in talking with uh, with uh, Praise of Folly a little later in the week. Just need to set a time for that with him. I think it'll be Thursday. Um, is Serbia? Um, we, we, everyone here should remember that the, that Lavrov tried to fly to Serbia, and all the NATO countries that surrounded it refused him permission to uh, cross their airspace to get to Serbia. And Serbia is, of course, uh, a, a, on a list to become a you know an EU member. But um, I just don't see Russia turning loose of that easily. And people like Soros and the rest have pushed hard for Balkan uh, accessions to the EU. And they've managed to get uh, uh, some sort of government in um, Montenegro that is willing to block Serbian access uh, to the Adriatic. Um, but I think that's one country to take a close look at. What's going to be going on with Serbia? And how it is that uh, Russia would bring pressure to bear to uh, reassert its connection 
uh, with this country that it has its historical relationships with. You know, you talk about how the Kaliningrad ex exclave is the furthest Western point, you know, but in some respects, Serbia, with its longstanding relationship with Russia, um, is a country um, that is very, very important for them in terms of sort of having their own uh, area of influence further in the direction of Europe. And if anyone doubts uh, that Serbia is of importance um, to Russia, well, just remember that Putin appeared on the scene when Belgrade was being bombed and NATO thought it could do basically anything there. And uh, Russian paratroopers were sent in and right around that time, and oddly, uh, a Russian embassy was bombed by the US um, or by NATO forces. Um, right around that time is when Putin himself appeared, when that line uh, was beginning to be crossed by NATO in terms of that old historical relationship. So keep your eyes on Serbia and on countries that could provide access to Serbia, uh, such as, for example, uh, Bulgaria, could, that could provide access uh, for Russia. So yeah, that's, um, that's, that's my, my last thought. Keep an eye on Serbia. Fantastic. Yeah. What I will say here is, is that this, the course of this war, and especially now what we're seeing out of uh, Lithuania, I think significantly reemphasizes the works of Mackinder and Speakman and Kennan. And additionally, we will have to pay attention in the, in the near future, what the Baltic Sea looks like in regards to, there will be an increase in ferrying and of course, air traffic in the area as well. But I think that that the sea itself is going to be an area of high participation, and we will have to be incredibly attentive not only to Serbia, but also Turkey, because whatever concessions Turkey either gets out of Russia, the EU, or NATO is going to play significantly into the future of how um, our Scandinavian friends to north of the continent will act in regards to what is currently happening in Ukraine. But as we've both said, we don't know what the situation will look like in a month, and we don't know exactly how the Russians plan to retaliate. So far, there's just been a live fire exercise. So this is why we have to get ourselves into the weeds of history, geography, and current political figures to try and make sense of everything that's going on. But um, always keep your eye to the horizon and stay vigilant. So um, with that, we're going to get now to our, our favorite part of our, our concluding area, which is uh, Frog of the Week announcements and uh, catching up on Super Chats. So I'm going to quickly share screen real quick. Share system audio, Chrome tab. Make sure I've got it open and ready for us. Fantastic. Yeah, so we'll do uh, some announcements here first, and then we'll get started. So um, here's what we'll do real quick. I'm just going to put myself in the background. Uh, so some announcements. Uh, my deadline for my gentle introduction video, it's probably going to be around 40 minutes, uh, will be for Garrett Garrett and the revolution was and why some of the old right figures pre-New Deal uh, American right figures are still important today. So that should hopefully be out by the end of July. So don't worry. Um, Substack now also has a paywall. This is going to feature like Charlemagne, uh, exclusive book reviews as well as my geopolitical essays. So if there are small events or takes that you want me to give on recent events, they'll be on the Substack, not just a, a whole stream dedicated to it. But uh, if you're already a subscribe star or channel member, then don't worry, you'll have access to it as well. I know some people don't like going through subscribe star or YouTube, so um, Substack is a great way to help support the channel as well. Um, learning my lessons from Morgoth and company. Um, my appearance that was on the CPod podcast is available after this video. I will link it in the community post, and there should be a real talk coming out sometime after the 4th of July weekend for you, ladies and gents. And then what I'm going to start doing, and I did this as a video for my wonderful subscribe star patrons, is that I will have a subscribe star post that is going to be a Q&A. So any questions that you want me to ask that are, you know, non-politically related, non-channel related, you just want to ask me things about, you know, fishing, bait, tackle, stuff like that, whatever. I've had everything from video games to, you know, religious questions thrown my way. And I'll post, uh, and I, what I'll do is that at the end of each month, um, I'll use a stream to answer those questions in a Q&A live so your questions can be heard. So all the more reasons for subscribe star supporting. So with that, let's get on to everyone's favorite part, which is Frog of the Week. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, so this week's Frog of the Week, since we were looking for areas that were relevant to our uh, geography, our lovely amphibian, of course, is going to be the Natterjack Toad. This is native to northern Europe, found in heathlands and sandy areas, and you can find it all the way as south as uh, that of uh, Spain and Portugal, but you can find it all the way north to the Baltic states like Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, so it's all over the place. Um, but like manlets, it's known for their distinctive gait and very short legs. So they, uh, they walk a little differently. Just they're, they're not as tall and as big as other frogs. They're, they're, they're manlets. They're, they're, they're distinctive. They got very short legs. They don't hop, they waddle. Um, and they have a very distinctive and very loud piercing mating call into the night with one large vocal sac found under the mouth of the male. And they're primarily insectivores, but, uh, they consume a very high calorie count in order to, uh, engage in vast travels so during their nocturnally mainly and uh in the night they will cover vast distances upwards to 15 to 20 kilometers so these guys travel um and they will mate in shallow pools and because these shallow pools require um they have to be very steep in order for their legs to help get or um, not steep but they have to be on a very low gradient in order to you know climb out as tadpoles um because of their short legs they don't always uh, survive when the uh, pools dry up, so they will often mate many times throughout their spawning periods through April to July. So um, these guys are uh, they're, uh, they're they're getting it on right now as we speak. So this is uh, this frog of the week for you all, uh, which is a toad. But all toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. So it's an important distinction. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that is our uh, a frog of the week here. And if you're new to the channel, this is how I always conclude things, because geopolitically it can kind of get dry, it can kind of get dour, and it can kind of be a lot of projections and maps and figures and history. So we like to end things on a happier note. Um, but with that, uh, we will get to just uh, your super chats and catching up with everybody. And what I will do now is uh, come with us back on screen so you can see our wonderful faces. And uh, let me refresh the uh, super chats real quick. And uh, let's uh, get back to what everyone was asking in the questions. Your financial support goes a long way as I continue to look for another normal wagey job. So let's get started. Um, the first one came from Son of Haster for $5 US. Thank you so much. He says, "My two, two of my favorite people on this platform. Well, cheers to you both. Well, cheers to you, sir. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, Monothalmos for five euros. Uh, he's a great, um, he's been really helpful to me on Twitter. Anytime it's something that sort of slips past Western media, he always sends me a DM and he was on the, uh, German election stream when Olaf Scholz sort of became the head of the new German government. Uh, he says Gorbachev offered to sell Kaliningrad back to Germany around 1990 slash 1991. These traders refused the offer. Well, I didn't know that. So uh, a little piece of history lesson for me as well. Um, and then Sam153 for $10 Canadian. My sympathies, you're in, in Canada. Excellent discussion, gentlemen. Considering the amount of U.S. officials showing up in Kiev, what's Merrick Garland doing there? Uh, what would Biden showing up there mean? Um, that's a good question. Uh, any thoughts there, Semi Gog, as to what would that look like if uh, Biden were to show up in Kiev? I... Uh, yeah, I don't know. His, uh, his handlers have, um, if I had to guess, I'm just speculating, of course, and I've been very wrong in the past. But uh, if I had to guess, his handlers are like, the last thing you want is Biden ever putting his feet on the ground in Ukraine because it just associates him too much with his previous remarks there and the nonsense that his son got up to. Um, but I am of the school of uh, thought. Uh, of many, which uh, is basically that the Ukraine has been a massive money laundering Wild West uh, uh, hive of corruption that um, Western powers have been using for quite some time. So, yeah, I imagine people like Garland and thinking back to when he was nominated to be on the Supreme Court, just horrifying to think about given what he's done as a uh, AG. Um, people like him being there just suggests to me that um, people are really worried about um, losing what they have uh, what they have um, arrogated to themselves there and uh, perhaps having um, some of their their manipulations machinations and corruption uh, exposed there at some point 
And they're probably, you know, it's it's necessary to send over members of the administration to say, you know, don't don't flee the sinking ship, don't flee the sinking ship. It's all going to work out okay. Uh, and I tend to think that it uh, that it won't. Yeah, I don't think. I mean, if Biden were to show up in Kiev, I think that would significantly just sort of it would be a mask off moment. I mean, we, I mean, America already has that, like we mentioned earlier, Charlemagne's point about John Q America doing something. Well, I mean, there's no more John Q America than the president of the United States showing up in a country that they're not explicitly right from, uh, you know, supporting, but they are supporting. So, I mean, if they were to show up, I think that that would lead to a lot of political escalation in regards to the conflict, but I don't think he needs to show up. I mean, he's had everyone from Nancy Pelosi there. Chuck Schumer's been there. And of course, you know, all the celebrity cadres have been there, whether it's Sean Penn doing a documentary or, um, you know, meet the Fockers, you know, showing up, standing picture to picture side by side with um, Zelensky, uh, with Ben Stiller there. So, I mean, he doesn't really need to, to, to show up as well there either. But hey, uh, who knows? Who knows? But uh, with that, um, th that seems to be it for the Super Chats today. Uh, Semiagogs, is there anything that you would like to shill or let people know about what it is you do? Uh, yeah, please follow me over on my channel, Semiagog. Uh, and uh, A Safer Space is an old one that has uh, some archived content. You can do that on YouTube. You can do it on Odyssey and on uh, BitChute. You can follow me on Telegram, on, and I hope you do, uh, on Odyssey and on uh, Twitter. In terms of upcoming episodes, uh, I will be talking to Dangerfield. Uh, late, late, I believe in, uh, the night of Tuesday or more technically uh, Wednesday morning, somewhere in there, we have to do it that way because of how far away he is. We'll be talking about meaning, semiotics, um, signification, um, and how that relates to, uh, creative processes. Um, I hope to be scheduling something, uh, very soon. It's on me. I have to do it and have not yet, but we're going to be talking about, uh, the art of spiritualism, uh, Pharaoh and I. Um, and, uh, as I said, uh, this Thursday, if I can make it happen, and if not, uh, very soon, in any case, I'll be talking with, uh, praise of folly on this idea of Russia re reasserting itself in, uh, many of these countries, Bulgaria, maybe talking about them trying to get to Serbia, what's going on in the Baltic, some of the black sea stuff. And otherwise I have, um, one that I'm talking with uh, conscious Caracol about. I definitely recommend his channel. I hope to speak with him soon, get another uh, update from the dark continent, you know, in terms of what's going on down in South Africa. But that's that's sort of the uh, immediate future. I'll probably have him ask me anything stream in there uh, before too long. But that uh, is it. Well, fantastic. And your links are down in the description using Charlemagne's findmyfriends.net. Um, remember, don't deal with, uh, you know, BioLink or Linktree. Charlemagne's got the place to go for all of your favorite creators and wonderful political workers and thinkers to go to. So by all means, that's where you need to be. His links are in the description. Um, and as for me, you heard my announcements. And if anything else comes up, oh, one thing I will announce. Um, it's a little out in advance, but it's in August. But I will be having uh, Dan and Matt of the New Right podcast. Right is in W R I T E, and we're going to talk about art and sort of uh, what the right wing needs to be doing in regards to art and cultural spaces. They've had quite a few of our favorite friends and fellows already on there, and uh, maybe this Thursday I've got something going on with Geo. But uh, stay tuned for that. Um, and what I will do now real quick here is just to say thank you to my top tier patrons who donate $20 or more or more a month on Subscribestar. Um, the links, of course, are all down below in the description. If you are a fan of uh, coffee as well, we've got wonderful mugs for Frog of the Week and all other sorts of crazy things that I've been doing on this channel. So by all means, stay tuned. And I'm glad that you're talking to Conscious Caracol. I'm glad that Ernst is finally back making videos. He spent quite a bit of time on vacation, so... It's been good to catch up with him. He and I usually talk pretty often. Um, yeah, he's great. Not, he's not great. even streaming. Yeah, he's, he's become a very near and dear friend of mine. Um, so I'm glad that you two are getting a chance to catch up. Um, but with that, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you all have a fantastic start of your week. Thank you all for tuning in. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, comment, all of those wonderful, important things for engagement. You are the people that keeps this going. Otherwise, we're just autistically ranting about maps and history. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all a great week. Be prudent, everyone, and we'll